Now, Daniel Ellsberg was, of course, a good man. He had a doctorate from Harvard in economics. He'd been in the Marines, the State Department, and the Defense Department, as I had been. Now, he'd gone to Vietnam, as I had served in Operation Desert Storm. What he'd seen there turned him against the war. And um, he was eventually a research fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now, he basically worked for Rand Corporation uh, before he came to MIT. That was a Pentagon think tank. I myself had ultimately hoped to transfer into the Pentagon think tank of Rand slash MIT myself. So I found out quite a bit about Daniel Ellsberg. And um, in 1967 – one year after I was born, I can tell you that Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara launched a historical study of the Vietnam War, and it was Ellsberg's department that was chosen to do the research. And that was the same department where I had applied for a lateral transfer from the Department of Defense into a civilian job. Now, what he learned there opened his eyes. Uh, to him, it was amazing because he found out that American involvement went all the way back to the Truman years in French Indochine. He found out, of course, first off, that World War II did not end when they said it ended, that the fronts had moved, Japanese forces had moved into Indonesia, moved into Thailand, moved into China, moved into, of course, Vietnam, that the Americans were still fighting them. So in the late 1940s, think about what I'm saying, in the late 1940s, Truman provided weapons and money so that the French could continue fighting the Japanese in Vietnam. In the 1950s, President Dwight David Eisenhower supported a police state in Vietnam to eliminate any opposition, calling for elections and unification. And there would have been no war after 1954, two years after the American-Japanese Peace Treaty of San Francisco went into effect if the U.S. had not tried to overturn the Geneva Treaty that the Japanese had demanded to be put into force in Vietnam. So this was not a war of aggression from the North. It was not a civil war. This was an American war of aggression, plain and simple. Now, there were other policy analysts at RAND who opposed the war, and they began to talk with Ellsberg. And they knew that people like themselves had to openly oppose the war because nobody was listening to anti-war radicals. So the defense experts who knew the secrets, if they presented opposition, they would be taken seriously. And they could prove that you didn't have to be a radical or a hippie to oppose the war. So they wrote an anti-war statement. And they sent it to the newspapers. They felt it was the least they could do. It was published in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And it stated that we believe that the United States should decide now to end its participation in the Vietnam War, completing the total withdrawal of our forces within one year at the most. Such U.S. disengagement should not be conditioned upon agreement or performance by Hanoi or Saigon. It, is, it should not be subject to veto by either side since this was purely an American invasion. Now, they needed more than one tactic. So in September of 1969, um, Mr. Ellsberg called the Democrat who had worked for President Johnson. He wanted to bounce an idea off of him. And he said the Democratic Party, he suggested, this was Ellsberg, suggested that the Democratic Party needed to take responsibility for their part in the war and that way they could persuade Nixon to end it. Now, the Democrats, of course, wanted no part of it. And uh, they thought he was crazy. They said if they took the blame for an unwinnable war, that it would be a political bloodbath for them. Forget it. They would only participate in a character assassination if they could take down the Republican president. So it all went down to interpolitical, internecine strife. Um, and it resulted, of course, ultimately in the Nixon resignation in the most grotesque parody of of injustice that I have ever seen in American history. And President Nixon wound up being scapegoated by the American people in a manner which is disgraceful to American politics 
that has its repercussions to this day where after the man is dead, people are still soiling his memory. So Ellsberg being jolted uh, by what was going on already turned completely radicalized, if you will, when the Los Angeles Times printed as their headline a murder charge against the Green Berets, John Wayne's boys uh, in Hollywood, the Rio Green Berets, however, this time, a murder charge was dropped against them by the U.S. Army. And this was a murder charge in which eight GIs murdered a Vietnamese double agent. And the Army dropped the charges because the CIA refused to let witnesses testify. Now, the CIA is in no position legally to make decisions like that without presidential approval so that insanity drove ellsberg to a moral decision he couldn't be part of it anymore in his office were seven thousand pages with evidence of lies murder and conspiracy to cover up by four presidential administrations so he did his best to get it out he called a friend of his, Tony Russo. Tony Russo was a co-worker at Rand, and he had been fired. Tony Russo uh, was sympathetic with the Viet Cong. Uh, he'd written reports critical of U.S. torture of Viet Cong prisoners. So uh, he got together with uh, Daniel Ellsberg, and uh, they basically talked about what he had in the office at Rand, those 7,000 pages. And uh, what happened was Tony Russo said – his girlfriend owned a small ad agency. They basically used her copy machine. Now, think about what I'm talking about. In those days, copy machines were, of course, uh, the size of a horse. Uh, you needed a doctorate to operate one. Uh, they had engineers who had to come over to operate it for you, as a matter of fact, because Xerox uh, had made them uh, in every way, shape, and form not to be user-friendly so that you would be dependent on Xerox for continual maintenance. This is why Xerox ultimately got slaughtered in the industry by the Japanese. This is why Xerox set up a Fight Back the Rising Sun campaign where they literally had actors that they employed to put on makeup to look quite elderly, and they would hire Vietnam War veterans who were amputees and again, put makeup on them to look quite elderly, bring them in with other actors who look just equally elderly, who would coach them, and basically they would remain silent while the other actor did all the talking. And when the Japanese would come in to sell their photocopy machines, their digital technology, which worked so infinitely better than the American ink and toner technology – Americans would be confronted with these two goobers. Kibble and Bits was the name of the acting team uh, that they would uh, basically deploy. It was a generic name for every team that they sent out. These dudes would basically uh, – one of the guys would wheel his wheelchair out of the room and the other guy would say, Oh, the Japanese, uh, they cut his legs off in the Bataan Death March. Yeah, yeah you can't deal with them Japs. And then it's a patriotic duty. You got to stick with Xerox. Uh, I lived through the war, you know. And then all these people would wind up still buying Xerox and maintaining it beyond death like a zombie corporation until finally everyone said, why am I doing this? And went towards all the self-maintaining, uh, if you could call it that, Japanese technology, which you basically use until it stops working. Then you dispose of it, dispose of it, excuse me, and then buy new tech, which is upgraded anyway. So this was how your economy basically stayed afloat for an extra five years was through crap like that. Beat back the Rising Sun campaign. I'm not exaggerating. This is how the American corporations work. They couldn't produce quality material or products. So since they couldn't generate product, they generated a healthy dose of lies to play with your emotion. This is what your media does. This is what your history channel does. This is why you constantly are shown – anti-Nazi propaganda years after the end of the war because we're still legally at war, but they don't have the guts to tell you we're legally at war. This is why what I'm presenting are the Pentagon Papers of World War II. Now, what happened with Daniel Ellsberg 
who presented the Pentagon Papers of the Vietnam conflict, he wound up photocopying in this little ad agency 7,000 sheets of paper with Tony Russo's girlfriend, Linda, spelled L-Y-N-D-A. And basically, the first thing they had to do was cut the top secret labels off the materials so they could actually access them to photocopy them. They copied them late into the night. Uh, the cops knocked on the door. Uh, the alarm had gone off. And they basically had to tell the cops, oh, uh, they still haven't figured out the security system. They have to reset it. Uh, a really close call that almost stopped everything right then and there. And it took probably a month of nights, if not two months, to copy 7,000 pages. And uh, Daniel Ellsberg knew he was going to go to jail. He warned his wife and kids. Tony Russo knew he was going to go to jail. And they tried to interest members of Congress. And, of course, Congress told them to go F themselves. Now, by the time that they got to Neil Sheehan of the New York Times, it was 1971. Now, think of what I'm saying, because all this started in the year before I was born in 1965, a uh, year after I was born, 1967, actually, when I think back on it. So we're talking about 67 to 71. This is how long it took for this man to be able to deliver a credible, credible evidence of what he was saying. This is why I am – I'm just flabbergasted. There's no other word for it. I can't think of a word in English. When I confront Americans who basically ask me, why did it take so long for you to come out with this? When I came out with it anonymously in 1995, 1996, and as they expressed last week or on Saturday, how that alone impacted our economy because it resulted in Clinton's ratification of a cessation of Japan's trade advantages on the market and a removal of quotas against American goods that resulted in Japanese divestiture and the depression, which we're all suffering from now economically. So that's something I already did and paid an enormous price for that in the quality of life of everyone, literally everyone around me, everyone in the nation, everyone in the world as impacted by America's impact on the world economy. And when I come out with this now, we're speaking about something that has an impact that will be literally earth shaking. So, We've got this uh, situation over uh, with Daniels L Ellsberg in 1971, where when he was talking to Neil Sheehan, he didn't hear from him for months and then finally got a call from the editor at the New York Times that they were printing the story. Now, think about what I'm saying. They were turned over 7,000 pages of evidence. They didn't print it for months, as opposed to what happened with WikiLeaks and what happened with uh, private first class uh, Marine Corps, Bradley Manning, and what he was leaking, which came out, comparatively speaking, very rapidly. So that's the difference between reality and a controlled hemorrhage of information. The reality is, if you've got something serious that you're dealing with, they're not going to want to print it at all. And when they do, it's going to be after months of deliberation. And only because it was the gray lady, the New York Times, did they even consider it. And what happened was as soon as they released it, they themselves, the New York Times, shut down the Times building in case the FBI tried to stop them from printing. They were worried about an injunction. Now think about what I'm saying. The New York Times worried about an injunction. And Sheehan, Neil Sheehan, the reporter, the journalist who took the 7,000 pages from Daniel Ellsberg, never even warned him. He got a full copy of the papers in his living room, and the FBI was coming for him the day he found out about it. So guess who else found out about it for the first time on the seventh, same day? Sunday, June 13th, 1971, President Richard Nixon. He opened the New York Times to look at a headline for his daughter's wedding, and instead – he saw a headline on – instead of Trisha Nixon taking vows in the garden at the White House, the headline was the Vietnam Archive Pentagon Study Tracing Three Decades of Growing 
U.S. involvement. Three pages of documentary material from the Pentagon study. And uh, basically, he followed the advice of the man who really ran the country, Henry Kissinger. And the National Security Advisor basically um, ordered him to not let the press publish the study. So they called John Mitchell to tell him to stop the publication or they would file an injunction. So basically, John Mitchell was the attorney general. His request was respectfully declined by the New York Times. And there you have it. You're talking about a situation where the media began to assert itself against the U.S. government, something that could never happen today. So Daniel Ellsberg hit out like a criminal who had conducted a Boston massacre bombing uh, with friends, continued to circulate copies of the study to other newspapers. And uh, this was the first time in U.S. history that the government used prior restraint to prohibit newspapers from publishing information. So they basically pulled the precedent legally. They issued a warrant for Daniel Ellsberg's arrest. They ordered him to give himself up or they would come in shooting. And basically, he had to hide out like a genuine terrorist for 48 more hours. And on June 28th of 1971, surrounded by friends and supporters and journalists and onlookers, he turned himself in to the FBI in Boston Square. He made sure he had as many witnesses as possible because he knew otherwise they were going to kill him. So two days later, the Supreme Court lifted the injunction. The newspapers resumed printing the Pentagon Papers. That's when he was indicted by a grand jury in Los Angeles, 12 counts, including theft, violation of the Espionage Act, giving unauthorized persons documents whose disclosure would endanger national security. We hear that again and again and again. You've got to keep asking yourself, what does national security do for you? What do you get out of national security? What do you personally get out of national security? Do you wake up every morning thinking, oh, my God, there's a mass terrorist who's going to throw a bio bomb in my bed? Oh, my God. Thank God for national security. What do you personally get on national security? Everything they do to you is based on national security. What does that do for you? And ask not what you can do for your country. Ask what your country can do for you. If there's any national security, it's not helping you out because you're still getting mugged. You're still getting raped. You still got illegal immigration. You still got gangs. You still got everything around you crumbling down into anarchy. That's their version of national security for you. National security means they're living fat while you're living on the ground in the dirt. That's national security. Now, Daniel Ellsberg, for threatening that national security, which you enjoy so much, that umbrella you live under that keeps you uh, supposedly fat and happy and complacent, he faced 115 years for threatening that. And uh, Tony Russo, of course, also indicted three counts, adding up to 25 years. That's when the Watergate scandal broke. That's when Mitchell himself, who had the, the attorney general, was indicted. And that's when the charges against Ellsberg were dropped. Now, the reason his case is so pertinent to mine is because also as an ex-Marine, also as an ex-Department of Defense worker, as someone who's unleashing just as World War II was orders of magnitude more impacting on, of course, the world being a global war, on, of course, history being a world war what i am describing is equally orders of magnitude above what daniel ellsberg was unleashing in terms of information concerning the vietnam conflict so in my case it is quite conceivable that there is a boa bob tree waiting for me with a noose that's got my name carved on it in the continent of australia where they're still under very British laws where you're guilty till proven innocent and I could be accused of anything from drug smuggling to assault. So as always, very definitely telling my audience out there, 
you hear any such thing concerning me coming out of Australia, that it is basically, of course, an ambush. That I may be walking there to a crucifixion, for all I know. So I definitely appreciate your thoughts, your prayers. Uh, we'll do everything we can to make sure that not only myself, but far more importantly than my life, my reputation, survives this. Uh, it's something I cannot say no to because it is Nexus Magazine. They are to periodical uh, alternative information media dissemination what Coast to Coast AM is to terrestrial broadcast radio alternative information media dissemination in terms of their reach. They are essentially the standard or they're – if not the standard, some would be reluctant to call C2C such, then they are at least the – several ton elephant in the room which no one can ignore so like an actor being asked to go to the white house you cannot say no if you're in alternative information media and you're invited to speak at a nexus conference of course duncan rhodes the editor of nexus magazine he's a man who's done some very challenging things and uh he has personally interviewed multiple times during his career Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, he was, in a sense, very charmed by that individual, seduced, if you will, uh, depending on how your perspective is regarding uh, Mad Dog Muammar, as Ronald Reagan referred to him as. Now, he actually believed that Muammar Gaddafi had nothing to do with the Lockerbie bombing. Now, be that as it may, whether or not that is the truth or whether or not that's his personal uh, uh, impression. The fact remains that um, on the basis of that alone, expressing such opinions to me telephonically via Skype, he almost certainly is monitored. He's been monitored for decades. Now, conceivably, they could pressure him with what he said on the basis of uh, his opinions. Um, they could literally accuse him in our new world of national security and its international boundaries or its lack thereof. They could accuse him of basically aiding and abetting terrorists on the basis of that. Now, let's hope that doesn't happen to him. He's invested his life, his finances, some would say his sanity, <laughs> into Nexus magazine. He was the only periodical that published the results of Project Censored out of Sonoma State University, the armpit of Rohnert County. Uh, or rather, Rohnert County is the armpit of Sonoma County, where the Rohnertians come from. Originally, a woman's prison uh, built as such, but converted into um, Sonoma State University, which is kind of like the same thing. Uh, at any rate, attended there for two semesters under orders of the Department of Defense to infiltrate Project Censored, uh, a journalist student's program in which they investigate underreported stories, funded by John McLaughlin of the McLaughlin Group, Ted Koppel. Uh, major figures in the industry, some would say figureheads. <laughs> At any rate, these journalists, uh, students, these majors, and their stories were published in only one place, and that was Nexus Magazine. Their results published every semester. This man has been monitored forever. And um, so when he insists I come down to Australia alone, this is why Kat Jenkins sends me letters in the text box saying you better come home and be safe on your trip. Bless you, dear lady. I'll do my best, uh, uh, if for no other sake than to um, just continue, as I said, to poke an eye in the finger of the powers that be. So um, let's hope that uh, what's going on with Snowden has the same effect in my situation that the uh, Watergate scandal did on the Daniel Ellsberg situation. I'm hoping it distracts the authorities enough where concentrating on me can ultimately be sabotaged by their own sabotage. You went silent, Douglas. Did your red light come on again? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, can okay. you hear me? I can now. Okay, yes. Now, that was interesting. Uh, oh, well. Well, we're certainly coming to the last few moments of uh, the broadcast, or 15 minutes, it, it'll go before we even uh, realize it. So I do want to remind people that I was on, of course, um, Black Empowerment Blog Talk Radio earlier this evening. I had to spend two hours on an interview uh, with Brother Leroy Baylor. 
And uh, during that period of time, we were discussing uh, my hard-earned knowledge regarding such topics as General Patton's use of African-American soldiers, the Red Ball Express, which was an all-African-American transportation uh, organization uh, within the military, something similar on the ground to the Mobile Airlift Command of the United States Army. But it was all black truckers that would drive through enemy territory behind enemy lines to bring supplies to American troops that were advancing deep into enemy territory. That was the Red Ball Express. And we're again, we're talking about often unarmed African-American truckers uh, driving deep through Nazi held lines behind them uh, to get white troop supplies. Uh, we also uh, talked about untold stories concerning the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, in other words, information they might not have even been aware of. Uh, I was certainly bringing up the fact that they were the only fighter unit of the United States in World War II to destroy an enemy destroyer. And, uh, of course, I was speaking of resistance of black justices stateside during World War II, as well as during Vietnam, uh, such as the Port Chicago mutiny and the reasons behind that. Uh, blacks were lo- unloading uh, and loading and unloading live explosives with no safety equipment. Uh, there was an explosion which ultimately killed uh, well over 300 African Americans, which resulted in a mutiny. Um, at the same time, military mun- unions were taking on a um, uh, unparalleled, unprecedented uh, one and a quarter million African Americans into employment. And uh, Caucasian American workers were going on hate strikes where uh, such uh, banners as were being flown about at the time were saying uh, – were basically sported um, sayings like, we'd rather have Hitler and Hirohito win uh, than work beside a nigger. So that's the kind of World War II enlightenment of the GI generation, which is uh, never spoken of today. Uh, I spoke of Teddy Roosevelt and African-American soldiers and uh, the difference between the United States volunteers, which were essentially Blackwater mercenary units that were uh, employed by the United States gentlemen volunteers or their officers who, like Teddy Roosevelt, were basically rich white boys who did not want to serve next to, quote unquote, niggers uh, in the U.S. Army. Because at that time, it was after the American Civil War between the states, the uh, African Americans who had just been released from slavery could find no employment. The overwhelming majority of African American men joined the army to provide sustenance for their families. Uh, There was not a white uh, in the main who wanted to serve next to them. So Teddy Roosevelt and many other United States gentlemen volunteers separated themselves from the United States military chain of command and raised their own private armies, which were known as USV or United States Volunteers. Now, these were all thugs who were working for basically very wealthy New Mexico Cowboys and Ivy League polo players, one of them, of course, being Teddy Roosevelt. And all of these officers had their uniforms hand tailored at Brooks Brothers, if you could believe that. And that's the truth. So that's the kind of situation we're talking about where blacks were taking San Juan Hill, Tea Kettle Hill, various other hills that I mentioned in that interview and handed over the flags that they captured to the whites who would then take photos with the captured flag and get the credit. Now, uh, I was also asked about black military geniuses who studied in West Point, and I had to bow out of that one because of the West Point situation. Mostly what I'm familiar with is, of course, it being a a power fraternity, uh, the military version of Skull and Bones, uh, where you've got what you call ring wrappers. Men who graduate from West Point will buy the big brass ring and uh, showing that they are, of course, part of the West Point cult. They turn the big brass ring upside down so that the main metal of the head hangs underneath their finger, and they use that to wrap on tables like a judge's gavel to attract attention in a room whenever they speak. That's why they're called ring wrappers. So um, I know quite a bit about the child molestation scandal at uh, West Point, but very, very little about the story of African Americans at West Point, so I bowed out of that one. But what I did talk about filled two hours, and uh, you can reach the audio archives, uh, I think, right now, uh, as soon as I'm off the air, of course. 
go to www.blogtalkradio.com slash the keys 107 all lowercase all one word or all uppercase all one word as a matter of fact i believe the uppercase might even work better uh even though it's probably not case sensitive but again that is of course www.blogtalkradio.com slash the keys 107 and the keys 107 is spelled t-h-e-k-e-y-s just exactly like it sounds 107, 107, the three numeric symbols. So www.blogtalkradio.com slash the keys 107. Do check that out. Douglas Dietrich speaking on uh, Black Empowerment Blog Talk Radio via the Keys 107 network with brother Leroy Baylor and Anthony the Engineer and many uh, people who were kind enough to call in, including somebody who was talking about the future of African Americans and the military, etc., which I was happy to address as well. So uh, definitely look forward to any opinions that anyone might have upon reviewing that audio come Saturday Night Firing Lines, which will again be the last Saturday Night Firing Lines uh, I'll be holding before my trip down south uh, to uh, Down Underland, and uh, hopefully we will um, see me coming back uh, by um, July 2nd or 3rd. Uh, and not winding up either in jail for the next three or uh, years or half a decade on trumped up charges uh, or or executed. <laughs> so if I wind up in jail down there, I'd probably wish I'd been executed. Uh, at any rate, yeah, Australia is a wonderful place, beautiful people. You don't want to see it through prison bars. So the uh, in terms of um, – the uh, situation right now, as it stands, uh, again, I do want to emphasize the fact that we've got the hijacker coming right after myself. Uh, the lovely Heather Holman and uh, her co-host Rectify will be on uh, for the you know the uh, roundtable uh, right after that, which begins about two in the morning Eastern time. And uh, after four hours on radio, I think I'm pretty tapped out. I'm going to ride out the last uh, few minutes with um, somebody calling in uh, to help me uh, get through the hour. So uh, either Noreen Helphand uh, or Ed Opperman are more than welcome to Skype in, and the lovely Kat Jenkins will bring them online uh, to uh, help keep me awake through the last few minutes. Oh, great. I've got a friend request from Alina on my Facebook, and uh, she has five friends, and she's dressed in lingerie, and I pressed a confirm. So hopefully I don't get a whole bunch of spam of naked ladies showing up on my Facebook timeline. Actually, I wouldn't mind, but, you know, that's – well, I do prevent people from under 18 from looking at it, but still uh, it covers any legitimate posts. Uh, so, uh, oh, Kat is saying, uh, who do you want on? <laughs> so I, I – well, Either Ed Opperman or Noreen Helphand. If anyone else wants to come on right now, they're welcome to because my brain is just turned off. <laughs> if it gets to the point where I'm looking at uh, at, at, at basically uh, what looks to be um, online hookers that are befriending me on my Facebook timeline, at this point, I'm dead meat in the water. So we have Ed Opperman who's coming to the rescue. Much appreciated, Ed. And uh, what was it like with Laurie and Fenton last night? Oh, and here's Noreen as well. Lovely. I'll let those two handle it between themselves. Uh, and Kat Jenkins, of course, will uh, just monitor it and make sure Ooh. that uh, – anyhow, neither's answered yet. Oh, she's trying to drag them on. So there's Ed. Bless you, dear lady. Oh, actually, so she be she was the aggressor. Thank you for initiating action, uh, dear Madame Jenkins, and uh, uh, love you. So, Mr. Opperman, um, you, you know, turn your audio off, please. Turn your audio off, please. Oh, I know. Okay, okay. I know what I'm doing wrong. Okay. <laughs> right. No, that's fine. Okay. And if gotcha, you don't know what sorry. you're doing, just turn it over your, to your daughter because she's got the brains oh, in the family. That's yeah. So how's it going, bro? Uh, yeah, I can barely hear you. My my headphones are all effed up. So I'm going to let you take over the show right now until Noreen is dragged on. So go ahead and tell us what's been going on with you. How was your interview with Lorian yesterday? Oh, it went very well. Yeah, I enjoyed uh, the whole Lorian thing. We talked about the Art Bell feud and the lawsuit and all I that kind of stuff. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you great. Uh, okay, well, tell me um, tell me what, uh, what what about this reality show? Okay, there's a couple of them. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I, I could reach out to your audience right now. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, a, a documentary series, 
and it's going to be about cyber stalking victims, and it's based out of uh, Texas. And I need a uh, uh, past clients and current clients and even future clients who want to be on this uh, reality, uh, this uh, documentary series. That if they have an experience of being cyber stalked or any kind of a uh, experience that uh, they, they met someone online and it turned out bad at the end, either they were conned out of money or they were uh, cyber stalked or a, a bad dating situation, uh, we can get you. You could be a, a, a segment on this uh, re- uh, documentary. And uh, there is compensation for it. Yeah. That's great and and uh, great. Now Heather Holman can talk about how I stalk her. That's a. <laughs> we have two minutes left, sir. So I want you to take up the last two minutes telling us uh, anything else you want to plug. Tell us about your service as a private investigator. What's your professional phone number again and the services you provide? Well, you can reach me at eight hundred four four eight zero seven seven two. I do a lot of uh, online investigations, cyber stalking investigations. I have an online infidelity investigation where I can trace an email address back to secret uh, online dating sites and personal ads. If you think you're, uh, oh, if you think your your email account's being spied on and you can't get a hold of this Edward Snowden guy, right? <laughs> you can get a hold of me, and I can monitor your email account for you, and I can let you know if anybody's accessing your email account and uh, spying on your emails. That's true. Well, we we got the end coming up. You were pretty echoey, and but other than that, hopefully everyone comprehended what you were saying. The music's on. Everyone loves you, Mr. Opperman. You know that. Uh, everyone loves Noreen Helphand as well, and everyone loves Cat Jenkins. And of course, I love all of the listenership. So everyone, take care. We'll see you again on Saturday Night Firing Lines. I think. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Revolution. Radio.